Dude, reading is so boring. These words are boring. I would like them so much more if they were, I don't know, big and yellow, maybe with a blue outline? Well, it's a start, but I wish Rayquaza was on there too. Perfect. You know, Pokemon game covers and even logos are pretty neat to look at, even if they can be hit or miss sometimes. And hey, there's something to be said about just being able to glance at a cover and immediately go, Oh yeah, that's a game with a yellow rat in it. But there's a bit more to it than that. So let's take a look at the art of Pokemon logos and box art. For just the mainline games. Yeah, so who would have guessed that the largest multimedia franchise in the world had more than a few video games, huh? With Japanese versions with differing box arts too, huh? With anime, manga, and TCG logos too, huh? We'll... we'll do those later. Let's start out with the franchise itself. Pokemon. Yeah, that sure is the Pokemon logo. It's iconic, this font is immediately recognizable as Pokemon. And hey, the logo's yellow, the mascot's yellow, it all makes sense. Since its introduction around 1998, this logo has never once been changed. Aside from one instance way later down the line where it was blue. Now the strange part comes up when we talk about a Japanese logo. Because this is it. Kinda. And yeah, this means for the first two years of Pokemon's release, it didn't use this. Honestly, that's really only shocking because outside of Japan, it's been here forever. According to what I found, because finding concrete information about this logo is shockingly hard, it was initially made for international markets, but it ended up being adopted into the franchise's identity in Japan too. This was their initial logo, and you'll see that it didn't stay like that for very long. See, for us English speakers, this logo can be found on anything and everything relating to Pokemon. And pretty much all of those times, it is front and center. In Japanese media though, the logo can often be really hidden. Take the Pokemon Horizons poster for example. You can only find the Pokemon logo that we know by zooming in right in the corner there. While on our version of that poster, right there, Pokemon Horizons. Because the funny green cat didn't make it obvious enough. Well, that's all well and good, but what does this part of the Japanese poster say? Well, that just says Pocket Monsters because that's what the series is properly called in Japan. It's still usually shortened though, anyway. All of this is to say that this logo does in fact appear and exist in Japanese media, but it's only a fraction as common. Like, it doesn't show up at all on the mainline game boxes, but eh, we'll get to that. Well, let's start off with Pokemon Red and Green. Hey look, we got to that! These were the very first Pokemon games to release. There wasn't a guarantee that they would sell, unlike now, where so long as Pokemon is on a thing, people are gonna eat it up. So what did they put into their boxer to make it sell? Confidence. There's no crazy colors or movement or anything. This is a sophisticated game for sophisticated people. The version's color paired with a complimentary silver is very nice, but what's in the center is what really grabs you. Think about it, at the time, nobody knew who these were, but their designs were so strong that they worked. And the name Pocket Monsters certainly helps. It's simple, intriguing, it makes you ask, Whoa, what if there was a monster in my pocket? <laughs> Even with the marketing jargon advertising Super Game Boy connectivity and link cable support, this box still manages to look genuine and not overly pushy on trying to sell you something. Even down to the small details like the version color being shown on a little fire leaf. Also, behind the Pokemon there's text that reads the Pocket Monster Trainer, which is complete nonsense, but it's cool that it's there. I guess it kind of alludes to how you're the Pocket Monster Trainer and this is your story. Now let's step into that logo. Even without being this, it still manages to look really nice. The bold purple text with some slight texture within, and even the added detail of the jagged ends of the characters all come together to make a great logo. And then Japanese Pokemon Blue happened, I don't know. Yeah, the updated red and green release that would later be used as a template for our releases. It was the same thing as the other ones, of course with the water droplet over here now. And while we're at it, Pokemon Yellow too. It's overall pretty similar, but with mentions of Nintendo 64 and Game Boy printer compatibility, plus instead of there being a lightning bolt or something to denote the version, it's Pikachu it's saying his name. Okay, that's great Pikachu, but can you tell me what game I'm buying please? Jumping back to their logos really quick, they're actually all very slightly different with different colored outlines. I assume they're like that for the sake of extra color, they pull it off pretty well. Now the next step would be to bring the game overseas. And that is terrifying. Horror stories have been told about Japanese game box art being localized for other markets. Castlevania, Mystical Ninja, Eco, Mega Man. But luckily, Pokemon was spared. There's no shoddily Americanized Charizard here. This is the timeless Ken Sugimori art. Although Charizard, Blastoise, and Pikachu are posed differently. Venusaur might be posed differently, but um, uh, he's gone, so I can't tell. This iconic logo is front and center, as well as the legendary tagline, Gotta Catch Em All. As well as a slightly less appealing tagline linked to the other version to collect all 150 monsters. I should use that in the anime. Link to red version to catch all 150 monsters! 
Yellow doesn't have the tagline, though. It was way more important for them to tell me that this was a special Pikachu edition, because I couldn't tell otherwise. The backgrounds here are really simple, just being the version's color with some brighter spots, but later on, things end up getting... Eh, marginally more elaborate. The element of selling the games based entirely on the cool monsters on the front is absolutely still present here, and Charizard and Blastoise stretching over the Game Boy banner gives them that extra little bit of intriguing wow factor. These pieces are still so cool to look at. The watercolor is such a distinctive look, although I guess it's less praise for the box and more so for the key art. The individual versions logos are really bland here. There's no individuality between them, but it's iconic if that counts for anything. And these boxes went down in pop culture history. Three years later, for Japan at least, Pokemon Gold and Silver came out. And surprisingly, the Japanese and English box arts are way more similar to each other than Gen 1's. That was fast. Using the same art of Ho-Oh and Lugia between them. Pokemon Gold's background too is very similar between regions, while Japanese Silver has a unique jagged swirl in Japan as opposed to the reverse of Gold's background that we got. The Japanese box arts also have another uniquely decorated character design to differentiate the versions, while English just has this font again. Did you know the name of this font? Yeah, it's Dekotura. And did you know that this one's called Andy? And that it's the same one used in Terraria? Neat. The Japanese logos are pretty much identical to the ones in Gen 1, although now with properly distinct colors. The English releases also have the special GS logo here, and they look pretty nice, a gold and silver swirl behind the letters. You might think this would be the logo for Gen 2 as a whole, but it was only seen on gold, silver, and crystal. No TCG, no anime, merchandise, spin-offs. Am I overanalyzing this thing? Yeah, for sure. But it seems like something that would have been used for so much more, I don't know. Speaking of Pokemon Crystal, it's pretty similar stuff between both English and Japanese, but with Suicune. And it also has a new background that looks like Aurora Borealis. The Japanese box art this time is a little bit more special. Behind the logo, which on its own has more elaborate colors and texture, there's a crystal that looks vaguely like Suicune's head... thing. It's a simple addition, but it looks good. The English box goes out of the way to specify underneath this logo that this is part of the Gold and Silver series, which makes me question this logo's existence even more. Oh, and I should mention, the reason the Japanese boxes here and even some of the English scans look darker is because they have a shiny look to them. No, like, shiny, not shiny. These games also have some, frankly, bizarre box art variants. Later prints of the games didn't have the GS logo down there, but then this release of Crystal still made sure to tell you that it was part of the Gold and Silver series. Oh, and it just doesn't have an age rating on it. It also changes out the bottom Deco Tura font for more Andy. My best guess is that some of these are regional things. Yeah, let me know. And while you're down there, you should, you know, hit the subscribe button, you know? Gen 3 is up next, and it may have been planned to be a series reboot, but you wouldn't be able to tell by looking at these boxes. Maybe that's a little harsh. They look pretty nice, Groudon and Kyogre are cool, and both the boxes' backgrounds relate to the Pokémon in question. Kind of. Kyogre's underwater, bubbles, lights coming from the surface, yeah. But Groudon, it gets a steel-looking texture on the left, and that bleeds into a very vaguely magma look. The Japanese boxer doesn't help either. Oh yeah, Groudon and Kyogre's iconic elements! The lights I see outside my car window when I drive fast! The Japanese logos are at least pretty though, with gem-like textures in the letters, which on their own look far more polished and less like a last minute. Yeah, the box is done! You fool, you forgot the title! Aw, oh, damn it! There! They even integrate a Pokeball into there, making this far more recognizable as a Pokemon logo to people who can't read Japanese. And I guess there's this too. Jumping back to the Western boxes, their logos weren't much special. They looked more like an integral part of the game's identity this time, instead of a footnote, but there's still nothing crazy. Something fun about the Ruby and Sapphire boxes is that we know of a beta version for both of them. They have way simpler backgrounds, even more simple than the stuff from Gens 1 and 2, and the version names still use our favorite Deco Tura font at this time. Notably, these early boxes still had the Gotta Catch Em All catchphrase on them while it was removed from the final box. Boxes. Why is that? Well, it's probably because at the time of release, catching them all would have been literally impossible. While the majority of GBAs can play Game Boy games, sorry Micro, they have no way of connecting GBA and Game Boy games together. This locks all of your Gen 1 and 2 Pokemon on the Game Boy with no way of transferring them. That, paired alongside the fact that Ruby and Sapphire just didn't have all the Pokemon catchable in them, led to Gotta Catch Em All being retired from the box art. Considering this is still the series tagline today, it's shocking to consider just how early on they cut it away from the games. Something something decks it, I don't know. Oh yeah, and these boxes have a little bit of a shine too. I'm really gonna miss this when it goes away. Jumping ahead to Pokemon Emerald, this box art is iconic. Rayquaza's front and center, facing forward, letting out a powerful roar. You know, like in the game. The bright green background even has these odd lights going up and down, giving the vibe that Rayquaza's ascending or descending. You know, like in the game. The Japanese box art here of course has the unique logo and different aspect ratio, but the background here is actually the same between the two. Before we know it, we're gonna have completely shared box art, just you wait. And also Rayquaza looks distinctly huge here. In terms of these boxes shine, both language releases have these triangles making for an almost confetti look to them. Just you wait, the patterns are gonna get more extravagant later on. 
Sapphire Red and Leaf Green are the very first Pokemon remakes. Specifically, they're remakes of the Japanese Red and Green, which is why there's no Blastoise here. I noticed a while ago that some of Fire Red Leaf Green sprites look shockingly similar to the Red and Green ones. Wonder if that was intentional. Still though, this box art manages to be distinct from both the original Japanese and the US releases. Charizard and Venusaur have new artwork of them, which looks great. The poses they went for were accomplished really well. And the version logo here even has a slightly different look compared to Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald. It lost a little shine it had, but it looks a little bit less cheap now. The background's not bad either, with swirling energy behind the version mascot. One thing that does bring it down though is this huge bubble in the corner advertising the fact that the game comes with the GBA wireless adapter. Sure, things like Emerald have the Game Boy Player bubble, these do too. But that's just a small footnote, this is a whole eighth of the box! Okay, not really, but it still makes me mad. Well, luckily I can buy one of the variants that doesn't have this bubble, because that's what makes or breaks my purchase of a Pokemon game. And on the topic of box art variants, the Player's Choice releases. Yeah, it's the Fire Red Leaf Green box with a heads-up display. The Japanese box wasn't safe either. At least this one's not a garish yellow. Oh yeah, these are nice boxes too. The slick logo from Ruby and Sapphire was carried over, albeit not gem-like this time, it's more so just vague fire and leaves. They even brought back the small flame and leaf version indicators. That's a nice touch. Also, the swirling energy, what the hell is that? Here is on a darker background, making it stand out a lot more. It even lets Charizard and Venusaur stand out too, and the darker color there makes for a nice bit of variety. In terms of the shiny factor, the English releases weren't much. Just a little bit of shine as a treat. But the Japanese releases have the speckled pattern. Okay. This might be a pretty controversial opinion. I know these games are very beloved to so many people, and my opinion on the box art doesn't reflect my thoughts on the games themselves. So, with that out of the way... The Diamond and Pearl box art sucks. Sure, they're iconic. The blue or pink light shining on the textured background with this godlike beast standing up front is cool in concept, and I mean, that's what a lot of Pokemon box art is, but this one feels unfinished and, I don't know, Naked? Bad choice of words, whatever. The logos are up in the corner now, and that's something. The lettering being sort of a mix between Ruby and Sapphire and Fire Red Leaf Green, it's got RST's font but with the cleaner look of Ferg. The biggest problem here though is the posing of Dialga and Palkia themselves. It's just their stock art. And Dialga and Palkia's stock art is just them standing there. Groudon and Kyogre did the same thing, but at least those guys had shadows and the box was more colorful too. The Japanese box art is marginally better, really just because of the logo. The cut diamond and smooth shining pearl textures look great, and because of the positioning of the logo at the bottom, the legendaries are made bigger, filling up the dead space that our art had. It's very slight, but it still helps a bit. Wait, actually, I've come around on this box art. When you have these boxes in hand, you can see that they're sparkly. That ends up hiding the boring background and makes them overall a little bit better. But also, they're sparkly, so top tier. There also seems to be another variant of them with the big beam of light in the background splitting up. Yeah, that adds a little bit of spice to it. Also, I'm just noticing this now, but the most common scan online of the Diamond Box art has this stain on Dialka's foot. That's not there in the real art. While Diamond and Pearl's box art may have been underwhelming, disregarding those sparkles, Pokemon Platinum's box art is just great overall. If that's not indicative of the Sinnoh games as a whole, I don't know what is. Having this, at the time, completely new form of Giratina soaring forward, looking to be coming out of some sort of portal, is such a cool visual. It even serves as some level of foreshadowing. This is really the first Pokemon box art to be actively intriguing outside of just, well, cool monster. It can make you curious about this Pokemon and how they fit into the plot. There's just a lot more interesting stuff to look at here. Giratina's got some glowing parts. The background actually has something going on without it being distracting. The Japanese box, while being very similar, has a much more unique logo, platinum text with gold borders, which explains the gold DS home screen icon a little bit. It's even got a little flourish of lightning. It kind of reminds me of Diamond and Pearl's opening in a way. Due to the Japanese logo too, Giratina was moved up a little bit. A negative here though is that the platinum box art has the shiny arts and crafts look to it too. I guess it's not so bad, but I think it would have vastly preferred the clean case art. In great contrast to Diamond and Pearl, where I think the sparkles really saved that one. But just look at it from a certain angle and you won't have that issue. I should also mention the special edition here. What is this, Castlevania Dawn of Sorrow? Man, Platinum has such great box art. I do hope that the next games, though, aren't a massive disappointment. Phew! I don't even know why I worry. These box arts are great too. Ladies, gentlemen, everyone else. This is a milestone. Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver mark the first time that a mainline Pokemon game in English actually has a logo. Heart Gold has fiery text with a gold outline, and Soul Silver has a nice blue text with a silver outline. They even have these stylish crests with Ho-Oh's wings forming a heart and Lugia's Lugia forming a wispy shape that could be interpreted as a soul. The art of Ho-Oh and Lugia themselves is big and beautiful, and they both sit on top of a back. Ground? A real background! No vague patterns or shapes, this is a map of Johto! A very segmented and bare map, but a map nonetheless! Heart Gold has the lighthouse from Olivine City, the bell tower of Ecritique, and these waterfalls, which is probably Lugia's chamber in the World Islands. Or I don't know, Tojo Falls, I don't care. Soul Silver has the World Islands, like, 
for sure this time, these are them. It's also got what looks like Violet City's Sprout Tower and even the ruins of Alf all the way at the bottom. Another thing to point out is this bubble here, advertising the inclusion of the Pokewalker. Now, aside from the fact that this indicator is less invasive than the wireless adapter, this leads me to talk about how Heart Gold and Soul Silver came in big cardboard boxes to fit the Pokewalker. So I may or may not have kind of lied. This isn't the real box art. This is the boxes art. The game case itself has a much more simplistic background with swirls very reminiscent of the original's art. These new ones though look a little bit more hand-painted or like calligraphy, fitting into Johto's more traditional Japanese theme. There's even a brush stroke over part of Ho-Oh's wing and Lugia's hand. Hand? Hand. Those were in the cardboard boxes too, but they got cut off. Plus, the rainbow flourish on Soul Silver's hearts are a really nice addition. It's just like the original box too. And of course, the Pokewalker bubble isn't on this one because how can you fit this into there? The Japanese case here is about what you'd expect at this point. Pretty familiar logo, just with a new color and texture for the letters. The English Pokemon text here is also pushed over because Heart Gold and Soul Silver are very long phrases. The Japanese and English box art is very nearly identical here. The Japanese backgrounds are just detailed a little bit differently, making them look a bit darker. And Heart Gold in particular has a glowy effect on it that isn't on the English release. The cases themselves though are identical. One to one, barring the logo and the age rating. And from this point on, barring a few hyper specific examples, these regions share box art now. Still, though, even though the actual box art isn't that much special, that outer casing elevates this to peak Pokemon game box presentation. Oh, I also found a variant of the Japanese Heart Gold box without the glow. I didn't know where else to talk about it, but it's kind of cool, though. Wait, the boxes and cases are shiny this time, too. But it's nowhere near as aggressive as this. Let's hear below. Pokemon Black and Pokemon White are often regarded as some of, if not the best games in the series. They tried a bold new direction, having an entirely new Pokedex and a bigger emphasis on story. One more thing stands out about them though. Their boxes. Now, on a surface level, they can be very easily compared to other Pokemon boxes. Cool legendary Pokemon standing on a simple background. But these ones feel different for a handful of reasons. They're very simple. Reshiram or Zekrom confidently looking forward while being viewed from a lower angle. This was in great contrast to other cover Pokemon at the time. Most of them either being stock art or some intense action pose. I guess they do use their stock art, but come on. This is way more interesting than this. But these guys are composed and stoic. They even have super subtle accent colors on them too. Of course you've got their eyes, but Reshiram has very subtle red lighting and Zekrom has very subtle blue lighting. You know, like fiery and electric -y. Just compare this very restrained use of color to something like Ruby and Sapphire, you know? The backgrounds are plain, black or white with a very subtle checkerboard pattern. The logos keep this simple look too, with an angular font, a slight shine on the letters, and a checkerboard outline similar to, um, that. It's very easy to compare these more simplistic boxes to Diamond and Pearl, which were similarly quote-unquote bare. I do think though, with the more interesting angles on Retro and Zekrom, as well as the addition of the unique logo, Black and White managed to pull off more of an artistically simplistic look, while Diamond and Pearl can look like early drafts. Also, raise your hand if at one point you thought it was weird that Black had the white legendary and vice versa. Yeah, me too. As mentioned before, we've gotten to the point where the English and Japanese box arts are entirely the same, barring the logo. That of course doesn't mean there's nothing to mention here though. The logo that the Japanese games had been using through Gens 3 and 4 has been modified for black and white. The characters are far more exaggerated, with varying thickness. The part of the logo that used to be a small Pokeball changed as well, with the circle on this character being used as the ball's button instead of the whole thing, thus spurring the addition of the top half of the ball up here. This is also where Pokemon is written, whereas before it was much larger and below the Pocket Monster's text. Swiftly moving away from Black and White's artistic simplicity, Black 2 and White 2 are much more interesting at a glance with far more going on. Kiram, previously nothing more than a legendary sitting in a cave, is front and center in these new forms reminiscent of the legendaries of the first games. I wonder why that is. Instead of the slick checkerboard pattern in the background, we now have beams of electricity and flames following the Pokemon's movement. They also have a sort of cloudy or wispy aura to fill up the space more. Even the logos are more different than what you'd initially expect. Instead of just slapping a 2 onto what they already had, the rightmost part of the logo was given a more stylish flourish, stretching into a triangle that then becomes either blue or red with an icy texture. It's a further tie into the fusion of ice and fire or electricity. Oh, it's such a cool detail. The Japanese logo this time around has the design on the right formatted to fit its own logo, of course, but they also changed this Pokewall design already. The top half is split into three arcs. It's nothing crazy, but it adds a little bit more to it. Across both regions, the sequels change the text quite a bit, too. Their checkerboard borders match the color of the legendary that was on the box, and since the sequels essentially swap Reshram and Zekrom around, the text border was changed to accommodate. And before you tell me, yes, I know this is the player's Reshram, this is N Zekrom. Don't worry, I played the games. Pokemon X and Pokemon Y can be considered the start of the series' modern era, which makes this a very appropriate cutoff. We've covered Gens 1 through 5 here, and next time we're going to cover Gens 6 through 9. Now, you might be thinking, 5 Gens in this one, well, 4 in the next one? Isn't the next one going to be way shorter? <laughs> no. Oh no, it's not. Now, does that have something to do with me psychoanalyzing these things like I'm some sort of crazy person? Yeah.